Today on the podcast, we have Barry Connor. Barry Connor works at Kennedy Castle as the director of spirits. They are starting to promote their three new Irish whiskeys, uh, and I can't wait to get my hands on some of those. Um, Barry Connor also grew up playing Rasa Pena, so we're going to talk about the two original courses there and the new uh, St. Patrick's links as well. I hope you guys enjoy. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Travel Worldly Podcast. Today, we got Barry Connor. He's director of uh, Kennedy Castle Spirits. He works with their their whiskey tastings in the, the hotel there. Um, we got the pleasure of talking with him a lot the other day about the whiskey that he's promoting. Uh, we're going to get into all that today. Barry, thank you for coming on with me today. Thanks very much, Hayden. Good to be here. Nice, nice. Uh, thank you for uh, taking some time with me today to, to talk a little bit about your, your company and what all you do. Um, so originally, you're from Rossapena, correct? That's correct, yes. So I'm originally from Donegal in the northwest of the country, and the village that I'm from is the home to the famous Rossapena Golf Links um, Golf Resort, three fantastic golf courses, mm-hmm. one of them one of them being a, an old Tom Morris design. Um, I think it was 1889, I think our, our club was founded. Um, yeah. So it's, you know, it's a pretty historic club up there, you know. So. Yeah, we're, uh, we're uh, probably going to be taking a trip um, up there in April. So hopefully we'll, we'll get connected. I think you're, you're coming to the States for, um, your, your whiskey, correct? Or when are you coming to uh, Florida? I'm actually flying out to Florida next Wednesday. We are, I've got, we're, we have distribution in the States right now in several States, Florida, South Carolina, Georgia, so I just got to check in with the, you know, the sales distribution teams on the ground and just make sure, I suppose, that they have the right, uh, the right brand message from Kennedy Castle that we're trying to give sure. to the American people and the American customers and, you know, that they're getting the, the authentic story and mm-hmm. always sounds better when a, a red-headed ginger Irish man <laughs> comes over and tries to tell the story as well, you know? Yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, we're going to pause really quick because uh, mm-hmm. I think my wife's home. <laughs> and I'll, I'll edit this out. I <laughs> uh, forgot to tell you. It's all good. All right, we're pausing. Hi. <laughs> all right, we're going to start back. I'm just going to start back with a question, and then no I'll worries. edit all that out. Yeah. I heard her coming in. I was like, oh, crap. <laughs> all right. Um, yeah, so we talked briefly about um, Kennedy Castle and your whiskey. Do you want to tell tell us a little bit about the whiskey that you're promoting? Yeah, so I'll tell you a little bit about the, I suppose the product and the brand as such. Mm-hmm. So Kennedy Castle is a, a four star hotel. It's right in the center of Ireland, equidistance between Dublin and Galway on the map. And as I say, it's a four star operating hotel, but it's an eight hundred year old Irish castle as well. Um, and it's been it was built in twelve oh nine. And a lot of the still the architecture and structures from then still exist, you know, um, including the, the main the main house. And we also have a Celtic cross here on the grounds that on the embankment of the Campcore River that runs down from the Slave Blue Mountains behind us. Um, the castle was purchased in 2017, excuse me, by two Tampa businessmen, as I say, Colin Breen and, and Brian Bean. Um, you, you know, both gentlemen have a, a long history with Ireland, family tradition back since the famine um, yeah. and the mass exodus. And they would have, you know, a, a real fondness for Ireland. And they eventually got into the hospitality game by purchasing the castle with a mind to getting it back to its original glory. But, you know, it was a very, very popular destination back in the, the late 80s and early 90s and it has yeah. thankfully got, got back there again under the right stewardship so one of the main goals when we when they purchased the castle was that we were going to install an irish whiskey experience here at the castle which we're currently doing um that will involve us aging all our own product here producing irish whiskey brands that we can then you know manufacture production and then bring to distribution all over the world so we launched the sister company, for want of a better word, um, in September 2019. And 
we've we went to production and we hit the market in September 2020. So we've Sweet. been, yeah, we've been knocking on a lot of doors, trying to get it into the right people's hands and getting the word out there, you know, since for about, yeah, nearly a year and year and a half now. So, you know, it's, it's picking up speed. We're working at it slowly but surely. And I think it's going to be, you know, a brand that's very, very unique. There's not too many... 800 year old Irish castles that are operating as four star hotels, you know? Um, mm. So it's, no, it's working out good. And we're, we're really, really pleased with the feedback thus far. So what's the name of the whiskey? And the yeah, so ev- everything is named after Kennedy castle. So everything is at the moment, we have four products. We have three Irish whiskeys and an Irish gin. So we are geographically, we're right at the foot of the, the Slave Bloom Mountains. So <clears throat> a large mountain range here in Ireland. So our gin is named after the Slave Bloom Mountains behind us because we hand forge botanicals from the mountains to produce our gin so that it's unique to this area, this region of Ireland. And then all of our whiskies are, they're all um, named after Kennedy Castle. So <clears throat> everything will fall under the Kennedy Castle Irish whiskey, Irish spirit umbrella. So, you know, you'll always, that'll be the forefront of all of our products will always be the Kennedy Castle, you know. Sweet. Yeah. And you're, you're actually in, uh, at work right now, right? Are you in the dungeon, you said? Yeah, I'm in, I'm actually in. Bar? This, this used to be called the private dining room for guests that had, eight to ten people so i'm actually and it's the only room in the whole hotel <laughs> well not the only room but that has relatively good wi-fi so i'm <laughs> yeah. it, again it's an 800 year old castle the ceiling's about 25 feet um, and yeah. so i'm i'm right at the bottom of this uh, wow i just noticed there's an actual deer head here beside me <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure the uh, the Wi-Fi doesn't travel through the walls very well, does it? No, the walls are like 18 inches thick, so it's um, <laughs> noise, noise, nor Wi-Fi makes it through. <laughs> That's awesome, though. Uh, at least you got plenty of whiskey behind you to keep you company. Yeah, we just um, we just finished production of our outer packaging actually um, at the beginning or at the end of last week, so we. We got nice gift tubes um, produced for a 10-year-old Irish whiskey, which is our signature brand. Yeah. And we were just doing, in the castle today doing some <clears throat> product photography, you know. So that's what we're working on today. Awesome. Well, if uh, you need any uh, taste testers, Jeff and okay. I are definitely willing and able. We won't charge you anything. <laughs> um, free free taste. Yeah. it's. Um, <laughs> I believe you guys might be stopping in here in the, near the end of the year, are you? Yeah, yeah, near April, so we'll we'll have to come and uh, uh, come see you. No, that's great because we um we've hosted quite a few people for tastings, you know, and we can uh we like to do it geographically as well. We do all our own products, but geographically we're very very close to the Tullamore Distillery and also the Kilbegan Distillery. So you know we like to you know spread the word of the the rich Irish Irish whiskey production history mm-hmm. here in the Midlands, you know, so. Yeah, we'll be awesome. sure. We'll, we'll be sure to fill you guys up whenever you get here. Sweet, <laughs> not, not too much. You can fill us up a little bit. Um, so uh, obviously, this is all about golf. You started in golf. You love golf. Uh, tell us how you started and what course you grew up on. So, I, as I say, I'm from Donegal in the northwest of the country, um, and I grew up less than a half a mile away from Rossapenna Golf Resort. I've been a member. My, my father's a, a past captain of the club and like me and me and my older brother are both we've been members since I think I've been a member since I was like 11 years old and I've been just you know it used to be after school every day I would go out with my dad in the evening and play six or seven holes it's just the beauty of living so I actually just live down the beach from the Rossapena so it's just a nip yeah. up the beach onto the first tee you get to play and between October and March it's pretty relatively quiet so you can just jump on do your practice and then you just uh, leave I your think, clubs there right so you don't have to yeah. lug them well, around we, we even we love that close it's, it's quicker to take them with you because rather than having to go into the, the clubhouse you just take them out of the car or whatever mm-hmm. if you're catching them when you're a kid you know and then just yeah. away you go 
Yeah, so we would have started off relatively young. I got my first handicap, my first official gents handicap when I was 15. Um, and the first handicap I ever got was 17 and I never went up. I all, like it's, you know, it's most people when they start off, they struggle a bit. But no, I, I kind of, I took to it fairly quick. My brother's a very good player. So I always kind of, I ended up, I got fed up getting my ass kicked by him. So I always, yeah. uh, you know, he, he was a much superior player and a little older than me. So, but he would always make me play a flat match. So it's a couple of years of getting your, your butt kicked. Yeah. You don't, you don't belong learning how to play the game. So I, I quickly got down to single figures when I was about, I was down to single figures before I was, I think 18. And then I'm currently playing off a handicap of just, I think I'm 2.6 at the minute. So, um, and you're, you're playing some, uh, amateur tournaments, correct? Do you yeah. play still? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. We <clears throat> and the good thing, one of the most beautiful things about playing golf in Ireland is that a lot of the clubs actually have weekly competitions. Um, you know, my my club at home, Rossapena, every Sunday there's a competition, you know, that's and they're all worth winning. Like there's there could be 60 people minimum entered, and then in in the bones of the summertime, then you're playing some pretty good you know, high, highly competitive amateur golf with both the team, you could be representing the club, but then also within your own club, we have four major tournaments, um, you know, and they're all worth winning, you know, they're all yeah. fairly prestigious, you know, yeah. And then we have the biggest the biggest tournament that we host at the club each year is um, we have our Scratch Cup, which is, it's like a pro, you can't, not really a pro-am, but it's like, the top amateurs in the country um, come and play in it each year. So Rory McIlroy has won it twice. Shane Larry has played in it. Um, you know, there's been <clears throat> there's been numerous top pros that have been that have represented Great Britain and Ireland in the the Walker Cup, and also guys that have went on to play Ryder Cup have have played in our Scratch Cup. And yeah, it's it's really cool. I played in. The first one McElroy ever played, and he's about McElroy's about five years younger than me. Yeah. And I was probably 21. I was playing, I think, I think I was playing off five, maybe so. I was probably one of the first people out in the morning. He was 15 years old, like a whippersnapper. And yeah, and he cruised around the first round on the Sandy Hills, which is the more difficult course, I think, in 69 on a really, really tough day. Yeah, um at 15 <laughs> at 15 yeah and I'll, I'll never forget it so <clears throat> one of the the furthest point away from home on sandy hills the ninth hole it's a, a long par four over like a, a, a really big gorge with them i mean it must be a 15 foot bunker right in the center of the fairway and this was into the teeth of the wind and we were all hitting drivers as hard as we could hit them to get over the bunker so that you've got a chance of getting it on the green with your second shot and we were finished up playing, so we all went out to watch him, me and my brother. And then he stood up and threw a ball down on the ground, didn't even tee it up, and he pulled out his five wood and he just stuck it straight over the top of the bunker when he was 15. <laughs> yeah, crazy talent. And obviously, we knew how good he was back then, but I don't think the world knew. But, yeah, he went on. He, that day, he won our Scratch Cup that day. He went to Ballyliffin. Yeah, he should take another top course in Donegal. Mm -hmm. He won that Scratch Cup. And uh, yeah, they're, they're worth these these things are worth winning, you know. And then, you know, he was still in school when he was in classes at nine a.m. on Monday morning, you know. After <laughs> so, it's uh, yeah, little it's, did he know he'd be traveling the world a couple of years uh, later. So there's some some really really cool um, there's some really cool photographs of him playing the first scratch cup at Rasapena, where I think the first pairing he was out with that day he was along with a guy an ex-pro called Brian McElhenney. He actually won the British, he won the British amateur that year. So he went on and played at Augusta um, the following year as an amateur. Um, he played the Masters as an amateur the following year. So there's some really cool memorabilia in the Russell Penna Clubhouse yeah. for whenever you get here. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I talked with um, uh, John Casey about, he, he works at Russell Penn. Obviously, you know him. Um, and he was just talking about all the, you know, famous people, golfers that have come through and played tournaments there. Um, it's a really special place. And then they they just added on a new course, St. Patrick's Links. How many times have you played that? And tell us a little bit about it. 
I played a little bit in the summertime. I'm obviously I'm in the hospitality industry myself, and whenever whenever the season kicks in, you kind of really have to pick and choose what like for me to perform in the big events and in, in my club, I need to kind of get my practice in at the right time. And yeah. uh, Sandy Hills was still only for recreational golf. And I didn't, I played it a couple of times. It's, it's unbelievable. It's going to be the best course, course in Ireland without a shadow of a doubt. Um, wow. you can see that the, yeah, the awards and stuff that it's been touted for already. And, and worldwide media and golf world and stuff like that there yeah. um it went straight into the best 100 in the world i think at 55 you know it's the it's crazy the scenery the scenery the way that they've cut the you know you a lot of people think that oh it's going to just be you know sand dunes everywhere and bunkers everywhere it's really it's, it's they thought it out a lot lot better than that there used to be 36 holes and the old layout of st patrick's um, even recently, I, th- I think it might have been around 2006, 2007, Jack Nicholas's team was over and they had done work and they had built some of it. But um, when, when Doak came in, he just kind of says, look, blank canvas, we're going to start from scratch. And he built 18 holes on where they were going to put 36. Yeah. And they're just, they're unbelievable, you know. Yeah, absolutely. I, uh, I think all the good golf courses aren't squished. They have air and room to breathe um i love a good wide fairway fairway right <laughs> well the, the good thing about like i find that the, the beauty of links golf like i've played a lot of golf in the states as well and like a lot of the holes are even in ireland you know inland courses it's all side by side and like you know you're getting inf- interfered by other groups you know if guys are mm-hmm. spraying it a little bit you know you know that there's other people on the course like I don't think I've ever shouted for at Ross Pena to somebody, you know, it's the, unless it's one of my own group and I'm going back to hit another ball off the tee, but yeah. you know, <laughs> but it's a, <laughs> yeah. you know, it's a, you're so spread out that you just, you feel like you've got the place to yourself the whole time. It's amazing, you know? Yeah. So we were talking about uh, some of the golfers that have played in the scratch tournaments. Um, what's your, who, who's your favorite Irish golfer? Oh, that's a good question. Um, obviously, what Shane Lowry done at the British Open up at Port Rush is, you know, it's hard to shy away from. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of lot of really really talented. You know, again, it, it brings me back to what what we do at club level here in Ireland and and in Ireland with with amateur golfers with the amount of tournaments that you're able to play. I think everybody actually has a fair representation of their handicap of what it should be because you play so many tournaments, you know, um, Mm -hmm. whereas, you know, in other countries, they might only play maybe four or five tournaments a year. And a lot of their handicap based then is based on recreational golf and and putting scores that maybe mightn't be relevant. So the the level of amateur golf for here in Ireland is very, very high. And I think that's why we've, you know, we've punched really well, over our weight, I think, on the international stage, you know, what Seamus Power, for example, is doing now, um, you know, he, he was a no, I don't want to say he was a nobody, but he was an unknown here in Ireland even five years ago. You know, he went to the States when he was young to go to university and he stayed there and he's just stuck at it. So I think what yeah. he's doing now, I think what he's doing right now with, you know, perseverance and just sticking at it, you know, we all know Shane Lowry won a professional tournament when he was an amateur, won the Irish Open when he was an amateur. So I think for Shemus Power to do what he's doing and like he got himself, he's above, he's above Shane Lowry in the world rankings right now. Um, and to get in, well, he's looking like he's going to get into his first Masters. So I would have to give give my nod to him at the moment for my most favorite one. You know, um, yeah. awesome. he's a, he's just you know because he's he he hasn't got a swing like Rory or he hasn't got you know the power of all these other guys, but he, he finds a way to get it around the course and he's just so consistent. Yeah. Awesome. So uh, between the three uh, courses at Ross Pena, um, what would you say is your favorite now? Um, that's a good, that's a really good question. You know, they're the two, the two main courses that are in play at the moment for club golf are the old Tom Morris and the Sandy Hill links. So 
two of them are completely different to them. The, the old Tom Morris, the back nine are the probably the best holes, you know, out of the, them 36, not taking into consideration the new St. Patrick's links, but the front nine are really, really difficult to score on. And then Sandy Hills for, you know, for a relatively decent golfer, it, it suits us a lot better because you need to be you need to be able to get the ball from the tee to the fairway and also from the fairway to the green. Normally in Lynx golf, if you can get your ball away from the tee, you can you can get something done around the front of the green because of the firmness of the ground. And but Sandy Hills doesn't let you do that. You need to be really, really good from tee to green. So I think Sandy Hills is probably, you know, the first six holes in Sandy Hills are every bit as good as, you know, for the views and quality of golf as as St. Patrick's, you know, but St. Patrick's just has 18 water beaters, <laughs> you know, yeah. whereas you know, <clears throat> Sandy Hills is the first six holes takes you right from the starter's hut right out along the shore at an elevation of a couple of hundred feet. And you're just looking out over the bay, Sheephaven Bay. Yeah. For, the, for the first hour and a half, you can you can come on, you can stand on the seventh tee and you can, you wonder all of a sudden, why am I six over? And then you realize that you were looking out at the ocean all day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Not focusing. On, on your golf ball. You know, yeah, I got gotcha. you. Yeah. Um, so, what what do you think uh, is the most underrated? We're going to talk about some other courses in Ireland. Uh, I'm sure you've gotten around to play some. Uh, what do you think is the most underrated course in Ireland that people should know about? Mm. And like, and a common one that everybody says is Cairn. Um, mm -hmm. you know, on the west coast of Mayo. Um. But again, Cairn's very, very well known now. Yeah, like it's it's part of the the West Coast, the like the Northwest Coast links. So, you know, them guys are doing a great job promoting all the courses yeah. along the West coast. So, I mean, like again, Ballyluffin is, you know, absolutely fantastic. It's um probably the most underrated course I would say, and it's a funny story because the first time I ever played it, I was invited to go there. The only time I've ever played it was with I used to work in a country club in North Carolina and the two of the members at the club were coming to Ireland on a golf trip um they came to play all the courses in Ross Penna and stayed with me in my family hotel but they invited me to go and play Art Glass the following day um and I had never played it I'd heard some good things about it and to me it's probably one of the most underrated courses in Ireland because it's so close to Royal County Down yeah, I think it, and it gets and it gets overlooked. It gets overlooked a little bit because you know it's with. I think it's got the oldest clubhouse in Ireland. Um, so uh, you know with the history there and the services that they put on, and the the scenery is spectacular. So I think yeah. it's probably to me that's probably the most underrated one in Ireland. I think that's on our list for uh, the April trip. Our glass. We're gonna yeah check that one out for sure. Um. It's the home. It's the home club of you know, touring pro at the minute called Cormac Sharvin. Um, I'm not sure if he won the British Amateur. Or, I think he might have won the British Amateur. Yeah. Um, because he played a lot of his golf at Royal County Down, so everybody associated him from RCD. But he's actually an hard glass golfer, you know. So um, yeah, I love that place. It's a really good track. Awesome. So. What would you say is your favorite besides Ross Pena courses uh, in Ireland to, to play? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, I'm throwing them all at you. Yeah. I mean, this last couple of years, I've played, I played a lot. Of, like, an, I don't normally tend to play any inland courses at all. Um, like, I just tend to play Lynx golf all the time. I would say outside of Ross Pena, to me, probably the best course and well, the best one of the best courses that I've played is is Trelly, um, in County Kerry, um, okay. it, it or Glashidi at Ballyleffin. Um, I played Glashidi at Ballyleffin on two days after the Irish Open was hosted there, and I think it was twenty eighteen, yeah. and they still had they still had the grandstands and everything up, and. I've never seen 
like I've played a lot of good courses, but I've never seen anything as in immaculate condition as what it's been in. Like I played, I played Royal Royal Port Rush a year in a tournament a year to the day after the Sunday of the Shane Lowry won the British Open, but they just had they had too many people play it. You know, it was um, it obviously had got a lot more traffic than what Glashidi had got. So yeah. You know, it was it was not as enjoyable as what Glashidi was. You know, it's just obviously one of the, you know, it's one of these things. You're victim of your own success. You know, they just got yeah. too many feet on it, and it was um, and it was a really rough day as well. It was <laughs> played <laughs> played Royal Port Rush um, on a on a stroke play tournament for the I've never played it before in a stroke play tournament off, and it was. The same tees and the same pins as the Sunday of the British Open. Um, <laughs> wow! I think I was lucky to break ninety. I was, um, I was, I, and I, I got a caddy because I was like I said to my brother, he played also. I was like, oh, you know, we're going to need somebody to give us lines off the tees. The poor guy spent the whole day looking for a golf ball. <laughs> <laughs> there was no uh, the lines that he was giving. Nowhere where we were hitting it. <laughs> we were just, <laughs> We were just putting it everywhere. Did he start giving you false lines in hopes oh, that you would yeah. slice or uh, draw it? <laughs> I swear to God, I felt sorry for the poor guy. It was, um, I, think it was, <laughs> I, forget, I forget what hole it was, but um, I put my put my ball into the, there's a bunker right in the middle of the fairway, and it was like 260 to carry it, and I thought it was a little downwind, but it actually turned out it was into the wind, and then uh, I hit my tee shot, went straight into the bunker. And, my brother pulled his left, so we decided to go. He thought he pulled it left. We went to go looking for his for like 10 minutes. We decided couldn't find his ball. Went to go to the bunker to look for my ball. My brother's ball was in, in the bunker beside it. <laughs> this is, we hadn't a clue where we were hitting it. <laughs> but you, you and your brother playing separately, or was it a, a team? Yeah, it was. Um, that was a individual. That was singles, yeah. Okay, cool. So uh, let's let's move to uh, talking a little bit about Kennedy Castle, uh, a little bit of the history. Um, mm -hmm. I know you you uh, mentioned a little bit about it earlier, but uh, what what does Kennedy Kennedy Castle have planned for the future? Yeah, so as I say, the guys bought it in 2018. We are and they've pretty much developed the, the majority of it. The 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 last piece of the puzzle is going to be at the rear of the castle. There's still an old piece of the Abbey wings. Um, it used to be a monastery here at the castle, so the Abbey Wings, the, the final third of them still haven't been developed. We, just before COVID, yeah. we, got plan, we got planning permission and, um, you know, we were granted the right to, um, you know, reconstruct or do up, you know, renovate the, the, the Abbey Wings. And we're, we're going to introduce and install an Irish whiskey facility where, as I say, it'll have a rack house where we can mature all our own product we can you know blend it age it and then we can obviously bring it to production and then we'll have a facility where guests can actually just go in and you know blend their own whiskies together bottle it label it put their name on it and take it away take it home with them you know yeah. um so that's that's one of the things we're working on at the moment we're we're going to be doing that also in the dungeon bar um which is like there's there's actually a bar in the dungeon of the castle. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so we're working on doing that as well, where guests will be able to, you know, have tastings, but they'll be taken straight from the casks that we're aging our spirits in. And, you know, just stuff, fun stuff like this that's really going to raise the profile of the place. Um, working really, really hard on, you know, opening up Kennedy Castle, the word of Kennedy Castle to a worldwide audience. And, yeah. We believe that our, our Irish whiskies are, you know, one of the quickest, but also one of the most authentic ways of doing it. You know, I think it really, it really serves the the identity of the brand and, you know, what we're trying to do rather than just trying to, you know, promote, promote, promote on social media and stuff. I think we have something there that is really intriguing and it suits the the concept of the whole place, you know? Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. What, what can our guest, uh, look forward to with the whiskey tastings how, how is that going to work yeah so what we'll do is um generally what would happen would be obviously the 
the front of house team. Will, I think for your whiskey tasting, I'm gonna I'll host it myself, and I'll be here to meet you guys, um, so that I can introduce you to a really in depth knowledge of how each spirit was produced. You know the the differences between each one, and then also you know what we have in the pipeline for the future. Yeah. Gen- generally, what we will do for the like of that as well is that we'll have our our food and beverage team put together a tasting menu as in food items that can go with each product um, and accompany them really well. So, you know, you, you guys are in for a really good evening and, you know, we'll hopefully have plenty of songs and stories and stuff as well to be to be shared when you're here at the castle. Awesome. Well, we're definitely looking forward to it. Uh, what kind of food can we be expecting? Yeah, so a lot of it would be because we're so close to the forestry and we have a river that runs along, like a, <clears throat> a freshwater river that runs along the, the side of the castle here. You know, we have a lot of amazing seafood. We also have a lot of great game, you know, venison, pigeon, stuff like this here. So we'll bring together a really, really authentic Irish menu that you, that's going to enhance, I suppose, the experience that you will have. We don't want you guys coming here and feeding you with, you know, cheeseburgers or, you know, we're going to. We're going we to have plenty proper- of cheeseburgers. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to give you a proper Irish, um, authentic experience, and the, the food will really match the quality of the the, the whiskeys as well. Awesome. Awesome. So um, I know we talked about this a little bit earlier um, before the podcast, but tell us the main differences between Irish whiskey and Scottish whiskey, which is scotch, uh, and, you know, I, I'm definitely interested to to hear into this as well. Yeah, so the, one of the fundamental differences um, with production and and <clears throat> Scotch whiskey, for example, Scotch whiskey would be produced using heavily peated malt, which is the actually use peat as in in Ireland here we call it turf, and they use that there for for malting the whiskey. So when they're actually Boiling the whiskey, they, they use the the turf fires, and it gives it a, a really really smoky flavor. A lot of places also char their char their casks with yeah. with with turf um, and and peat, and it um, gives it a really really sm- as you know, like Scotch has got a really really smoky finish to it. Um, Irish tends to be a lot smoother. Scotch then be aged for two years. Irish be aged for three years. So it takes longer for Irish to mature. The thought being that it'll be a lot cleaner of a spirit and, you know, less raw by the time it's mm-hmm. aged. And the majority of Irish whiskey production is done now in ex-American bourbon casks. So Irish whiskey tends to be that little bit sweeter um, and a, a lot easier on the palate than Scotch whiskey. So that fundamentally, that's the difference. You know, generally it's, you can't really go buy it anymore is because Scotch whiskey is branching off into more, you know, mainstream, mainstream stuff that every, the everyday drinker will, would like. And Irish whiskeys are a lot of the top Irish whiskey brands. Now we're going for peated whiskey, you know, so it's the, the, the kind of the collaboration between the two is kind of crossing over at the minute. It's kind of, you wouldn't say they're they work against each other. They kind of both complement each other kind of really well, both markets. But I mean, there's obviously the old the old fight that Scottish whiskey believe that they're they started producing the you know the the glorious spirit first of all. But we all know it all happened here in Ireland, and <laughs> there's no the, the feud between the the two countries is that our Irish whiskey yeah. or our whiskey was was created first. I love that. Yeah, yeah. So Scottish think that they were first, but we all know that we've been we've been creating potching here in Ireland for centuries. You know, it's been yeah that was that was an illegal distillation process, and it was a it was a clear it came it could be clear or dark spirit, but like could be hundred proof this stuff, and it would blow your head off. But we've been making yeah. it for centuries. You know, that's <laughs> awesome. Uh, what can you tell our first time guests what to expect when coming to Ireland? I mean, the one thing that people will always, you know, you, you'll come and you'll play the most fantastic golf courses. You'll stay in 
the, like the best best hotels like the level of hospitality in Ireland is very very it's probably the best in the whole of Europe you know anything from three star and up in Ireland in a hotel you're going to be you're going to have really really good facilities mm. and you know saying that the one thing that will always stick out whenever you leave I believe will be the welcome that you get like you everybody for international visitors is just so welcoming you know it's the people that make Ireland you know it's them um, no matter how bad of a day you had in the golf course or how bad the weather was you know there's still always going to be an old man sitting at a fire in a little pub in the middle of Kerry that will welcome you as if he's known you all his life and I think these are the kind of things that people enjoy the most when they come here um is the experiences you know yeah and then for uh golf wise um what kind of advice would you give to people who've never played Lynx golf before, never traveled to a country like this and played, um, you know, the kind of Lynx golf that they have in Ireland? Yeah. Um, it's, it's a funny question that, you know, because I've seen so many times, you know, American visitors coming to Rasa Pena and I used to caddy when I was a kid for like every summer and American yeah. visits all the time. And, you know, all, they're expecting just torrential rain, hurricane wind the whole time in the summer. Whereas, you know, you can, you can, you need to be very unlucky to get a really bad day from kind of May around to se September, October. You know, yeah. I would be, be very wary about one, the clothing that you take because it's near impossible to play in some of the, the wet gear that you guys take with you, but also, Keep it close. Like the weather can change relative, very quick here. And it, and it is, we have really, really accurate weather for a couple of days before. Um, mm -hmm. And that'll that's going to determine how you go about playing golf courses as well. So, you know, if you think that, you know, if you're a good player and you see that it's going to be one day, you know, you don't need your 10 and a half degree driver but with a regular shaft because you're not going to be able to hit the ball. You, you need... You need a like I use a two iron everywhere. So if you're yeah. if you're a relatively good player in the middle of the summer, the courses don't tend to be that long. So if you can, you know, if you can get the ball on the short grass, anything from 200 yards and on, it's going to run another hundred yards. So you know, and then you know that's that's probably the main advice. Just be prepared for the weather. You know, the weather won't be as bad as what you think it's going to be in the summertime. Like because I never like always. Uh, Russ Penny used to love it because the guys would have to go in and buy more t-shirts because they didn't have enough t-shirts with them for the for the week, you know. But it was um he always always prepared. Like last year we we hosted the a European tour event, a European tour senior event, the Irish Open for over the over fifties. And Thomas Bjorn was the winner. I don't know if you've seen any of the coverage, but Ross Penna was baked and it was like I'm talking Celsius here, so it was high twenties to low thirties. So you're talking like mid eighties, yeah, Fahrenheit. So the weather was fantastic. The the fairways were as hard as a rock. I mean, it was just absolutely perfect links golf. And you know, if you know that that's what the weather's going to be like, it's you know, I would I would plan to 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 dress yourself accordingly because <laughs> you can get uh, you can get caught out very quick. Yeah, for sure. <clears throat> so I know, uh, obviously, you've played a lot of courses, but w what's left on your your golfing bucket list? I mean, I'm going to, as I say, I'm, a lot of a, a lot of my golf my bucket list is outside of Ireland. You know, it's yeah. um, <clears throat> I've pretty much played all anything that I want to play in Ireland, and like I've played re quite a bit in the US, but like I've I used to live in Charleston, South Carolina, so I've played all the Kiowa Kew courses, and mm -hmm. um, I'm going to Florida now next week, and I'd like to play. I'm spend a little bit of time around um, <clears throat> Palm Beach. So I'm, I've got a cousin there that he plays, you know, some of the relatively big country clubs around there. So I'm hoping to get on some of the, you know, some of the good courses around there. I don't want to. I don't want to bum myself up and try and get on. <laughs> you know, seminal, but I'm going to try my best <laughs> to get on some of the good ones, you know. Well, I've got a buddy uh, who works at um, 
TBC Sawgrass, if you were interested in going there as well. I don't know how close that'll be to Jacksonville. But, yeah, um, I'm, going, I'm actually going to go to the first day of the – I went to the players in 2018. Um, I went to the Masters and the players within a, four weeks of each other in 2018. So I'm going to go to the players this year. It's on – I think the first day is the 7th or 8th of March. So I'm going to go to the first day of that. Um, I, might, I might meet you there. <laughs> Yeah, I'll be going, so I'll let you know. I'm going straight down to uh, after that. Then I've we have got so Kennedy Castle is hosting a a tasting event at the the Jupiter Irish Fest. Um, it's an Irish festival in Jupiter, so yeah. we're gonna do gonna go there and promote the brand a little bit and let all the great people of Jupiter get drunk on Kennedy Castle Irish whiskey. Love it. <laughs> love it well barry thank you so much for uh for coming on i had a great time i uh, can't wait to to taste some whiskey um yes. i'm starting to build my my palate for um scotch and iris whiskey and i know my father-in-law has just been loading me up with um every christmas with a new bottle of scotch so now we're gonna have to get us some some iris whiskey in the in the rotation yeah. so Definitely. Um, we're coming quick. Irish whiskey's catching up fast. Scotch is still well ahead of us, but we're on we're we're tracking it down and we're gonna catch it hopefully relatively soon, you know. So I love we're it. on the hunt. <laughs> well, next time we're in Ireland, we'll definitely uh link up, play some golf, uh take a look at the castle. Um, but for now, um till next time. Thanks, Aiden. Yep, thank you. Bye. Well, that is gonna wrap up Travel Worldly Podcast today. Thank you again to Barry for coming on and uh, telling us about his life growing up at Rossapena and talking a little bit about us, the uh, Kennedy Castle Irish Whiskey with us. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you did, please share the video, and I hope to see you all next week.